Hey folks, I'm back. Uh, my phone is just a rude asshole and just cut me off without any warning. Uh, and uh, I don't even know why, so uh, what are you going to do? Um, I think I just uh, actually had the phone too full of podcasts, uh, podcast episodes that I downloaded about sports. So I had to delete a few of those, so I'm back with you. Um, so hopefully I won't be cut off again like that. I'm just going to have a sip of my tasty beverage here. Notice for those of you in the Diet Coke um, um, fan club that I'm not drinking a trash drink, but I'm drinking a quality Diet Pepsi, which is different from Pepsi Max and different from Pepsi Zero Sugar. Um, so to please keep all your various you know Pepsi brands straight. Um, okay, the good life. <sighs> okay, so let's go back to Socrates' Taming of Calicles. Um, so the real contest, hedonism versus the self-disciplined life, right? That is that is the, the real main um, conflict contest uh, that we are asked to choose between uh, in this dialogue. Um, rhetoric appeals, rhetoric in the degraded version, rhetoric, sophistry in the degraded version uh, that uh, Callicles and Gorgias practice at least according to Plato, um, that only appeals to the hedonistic part of us. It doesn't actually appeal to the part of us that can be the best. It doesn't appeal to the part that is capable of taking in self-discipline and training in the service of a longer, healthier life of the mind and the body. So um, now the way that Socrates is actually going to sort of stop Callicles is through rhetorical tactics, right? So he's going to use some, not tricks, but he's, he's going to use some techniques to kind of silence Callicles. Uh, and these techniques may not, at the end of the day, be kind of... Um, they're not necessarily, as I'll talk about in a second, they're not necessarily because he ultimately convinces Callicles, but simply because he's he's capable of using these rhetorical tactics to turn Callicles' arguments into contradictions or to show that Callicles is involved in contradictions and then that Callicles is not able to get out of those. And so Callicles just isn't able to say anything else. Um, so the way, a couple, a couple of ways that Socrates does this um, one is through showing that Callicles has actually mixed up the pleasure and the good. So he's talking about what's pleasurable as if it's the same thing as what is good, and that a pleasurable human life is therefore the same thing as a good human life. And Socrates is able to show that there are contradictions, internal contradictions within this view. Um, and he uses the thirst analogy here to show that pleasure and pain can actually go together, um, that um, we, our bodies, for instance, are capable of experiencing pleasure and pain with respect to the same thing almost at the same time, whereas good and bad, at least Socrates claims and Callicles will agree, good and bad don't go together, can't, can't go together at the same time. So therefore, something that's talking about an argument about the good or what is good, if it admits of having these partial, you know, uh, if it, if it, if it's somehow mixed in the way that Callicles version is mixed in the way that pleasure can always be mixed with pain, um, then it, it has to be something entirely different. It's, it's a different category than, than making arguments about the good. And Cal so he's able to catch Callicles in this. Now, whether Socrates is right at the end of the day, um, is a different question. And, you know, philosophers, and we're not going to go into this, but, it, um, it's just a, I think a fair thing to consider that, some of the arguments that Socrates makes about the nature of good or the good um, may not be that fantastic an argument at the end of the day. And so good and bad might actually be able to be kind of mixed in some way in the way that pleasure and pain are. Um, and if that's the case, then Socrates might not be right and and he may be you know getting Callicles tripped up for not a very good reason but he's able to trip Callicles up because Cal you know he's able to get Callicles to agree to um the, some of the propositions uh and extensions of Callicles argument and then he's able to trap Callicles um okay so parenthesis on that aside whether Socrates is actually making good argument um he also uh is able to trip Callicles up by forcing Callicles to recognize that 
if it's only about an individual's pleasure and it's their subjective experience of what's pleasurable to them, well, then the pleasure that one of the sheeple experiences, that a coward experiences in doing cowardly things and not taking risks, whatever, um, there's no way to distinguish that from the pleasure that uh, one of Calicles' heroes, one of these, you know, lions, um, their pleasure in risk-taking and, you know, whatever sensual sensual pleasures they get. Um, there's no way to distinguish those to, to say that one is better than the other. And so essentially, if it's all just up to the individual to decide what's pleasurable and not, then Calicles doesn't have a good argument. Now, you may be able to make a good argument if you're not Calicles, but Calicles is not able to make a good argument for why the strong, per quote unquote, strong person, uh, why their pleasures are somehow superior. He just doesn't have a way because he reduces it to just what the individual feels is pleasurable to them. So, and, and that's an unpleasant consequence for him then to say, well, that a coward and a courageous man's pleasure are somehow the same. That, that's, uh, that's a problem for Calicles' argument. Final point to consider on this, uh, this slide uh, on the taming of Calicles is that Socrates really this this is the kind of the big analogy that he makes uh with um with the leaky vessel for him for socrates it can't be the case that if you're constantly like a leaky vessel in that you're taking in in, in the way that pleasures are where you take in pleasures and then you kind of get full and then those they sort of leak out of you like you know whether it's um eating or drinking or uh, you know, or eating edibles, uh, you know, or sex or whatever, you get your fill of something and then it kind of goes away and then you need to refill um, yourself with whatever the pleasurable thing is. For Socrates, that just doesn't make sense to say that that's what it is to live a good human life. The need to constantly be refilled makes, makes him think, he doesn't kind of explicitly make this argument, I'm just kind of filling in the gaps here, but for him, the idea is there's something kind of defective about your life if you're constantly, essentially the, the, the argument would be you're, con, you're kind of like an addict. If you're always needing to get another fill to get your next fix, you're always chasing, then it means you're not living a kind of flourishing, satisfied existence where you, you kind of have some possession of a good life that you're able to, you know, day in and day out enjoy um, and to know that you've achieved something, that you're, you know, living a life of, you know, kind of fulfilling your potential. That doesn't require this kind of constant feeding, uh, again, kind of like the way an addict has to kind of just get their next hit. That's basically what, uh, what Socrates is suggesting is, to, to live a life dedicated to pleasure, to be a hedonist is essentially to be an addict. Even if even if you're not as out of control maybe as an addict is, it's essentially to live an addictive life. Now, there are some really interesting um, modern philosophers who who are able to justify this, not to to justify life as an addict, but Albert Camus, uh, the famous uh, French um, existentialist thinker from the mid 20th century, has a specific argument about this, that, you know, this is the kind of the way human life is, that we experience, you know, pleasures and that th those are good and that then they go away and then we recognize we have to fill ourselves up again and there's nothing wrong with that. This is just the way it is. Um, and... Um, the, you know, this is just something that for Socrates is not going to count as living a, a, a good life. The idea is that the to, to live a good life where kind of the soul and the mind um, are in this kind of um, in, in this kind of healthy way of life. It's you're always kind of in possession of this health of the soul. Uh, you're always in possession of the good. And it's not a kind of radical indecision or radical uncertainty day to day whether you're going to get your fill of the thing to kind of you know enable you to be having a good day uh in the way that some you know that a, a body uh kind of addicted to physical pleasure um uh, is living so um anyway so that's you know for socrates that's really what you're going to have is the best life is it means you're you're some you're somewhat more like a person who is a virtuoso Again, to, to go back to Homer, but a different version of virtue, of virtuosity. Um, 
you know, you're, you're like, uh, a, you know, a, um, you know, a, a skilled guitarist or rapper or scientist or something where like from day to day, it's not a question of like, whether you have your skill, whether you have possession of that thing. Um, you always have it. Maybe you have better and worse days, but the thing that is enabling you to live a good life that means that you're flourishing is not radically contingent on whether you're getting some kind of sensual pleasure hits every day. Um, it's because you possess some skills and quality of the soul that you just always have, that, that are just always present. For Socrates, that's much more about living with the good and, and living a good life. Um, Okay, so then let's let's think about the upshot. So next slide, the upshot one. Let's think about the upshot of what this means um, for um, politics and, and rhetoric. Um, so notice that Socrates silences Callicles after page 87. And Callicles will kind of grudgingly admit to Socrates or acknowledge Socrates being right and say, yes, go on, go on, go on. Um, but it seems pretty clear that he is not doing this willingly. He's been tamed. He's been silenced. He, he realizes that his arguments aren't able to make cohesive sense. And so Socrates has embarrassed him and silenced him. Um, but his continued agreement, and it's for the whole rest of the dialogue. So it's all of this, you know, um, all of this for the, the final parts of the dialogue where Calcles is clearly just saying, yeah, yeah, fine, whatever. Yeah, sure. Fine. Go, you know, go on, go on, go on, have a good time with yourself. Um, what we should notice if we, if we think that there's something weird about that, you should probably think that Plato is doing this intentionally, that this is not, um, this is not something hidden, but he's showing the way that Calcles has been silenced and and is but is not actually convinced um and so the part where essentially socrates ends up arguing with himself um you know some people have taken this as a sign that plato is is just not very good at writing a dialogue or that he's showing us an argument that's not very convincing but that's kind of the point that plato is actually showing us that we know that callicles isn't convinced and socrates is going to have this argument with himself and plato is actually kind of making a joke here um may not be the funniest joke you might not you might not be rolling on the floor laughing um if uh you know if you've even made it that far in the text but socrates uh, sorry plato is showing us this like he's he's kind of showing us his his cards and so he's showing us that Socrates is able to use some of the same rhetorical tactics and techniques that the sophists like Gorgias and uh, Paulus and Callicles have used and that they teach people. Socrates will also use these to silence them, but it doesn't actually result in anyone being truly convinced. So this is Plato actually showing us the limits of rhetoric. So he's actually making a kind of rhetorical critique of rhetoric. Um, he's showing us rhetoric's power, but he's also showing us, us its limits. And this is why he actually moves on to something else um, later in the dialogue. So move to slide upshot two. Um, so rhetoric is able to silence rhetoricians, at least in this context. I'm going to talk about the present, the present day um, in, in a minute. Um, he shows us rhetoric is able to do that, but it but it doesn't seem to be able to go much farther. You need something else. Okay, how do we get there? Well, part of part of the way is Plato is, I think, not being facetious, uh, or Socrates is not being facetious, when he argues that he actually is the only true statesman, that he is the one who is actually at least in Plato's view, the one with the truest understanding of what it is to be a leader in politics in a human community. Um, and that means you don't accept just what you think everyone wants to hear in order to gain power. You're not engaged in a marketing exercise. You're not trying to make your product most um, appealing to the widest number of people and all you're trying to do is get the majority vote or, you know, sell the most products in order to win. Um, that's, that's the sophist's view of what it is to be a politician. And 
in Plato's view, that's what most Athenian politicians, most leaders of the Athenian democracy have done. They have merely um, tried to style themselves so that they would be appealing to the most people, um, but without any concern for the actual health of that political community. So rather than actually trying to look at what people need, they just looked at what people wanted. So they, they pandered to people's needs instead of actually trying to look at reality and say, what is actually the healthiest thing for us as a community to do? This is what Socrates thinks he is doing. He thinks of himself as a doctor or a trainer, the way a doctor or a trainer says, yo, I've got some unpleasant things that you need to do in order to get better. You need to do these exercises. You need to not eat these foods that you really like if you actually want to live a long and healthy life. So he is a doctor or a trainer for the soul or the mind. This is what he thinks he is doing and that this is what he thinks an actual political leader should do. So real men, he says, and so this is in the, the kind of section uh, later, um, later in the text in which he's talking about what it is uh, you know, what what he is doing and also the kind of, he's he's giving us the these myths in the form of what happens in the afterlife to people. Um, real political leaders should actually be willing to court death, which is, of course, what Socrates himself does uh, in, in his real life. Um, court death, if that is what it takes to get people to see the kind of the error of their ways. Your job as a politician is to say what is true and what people and what the community need. And if that is unpopular and if people are going to put you to death for that, well, that's on them. That's not on you. Your business is not to stay alive. Your business is to, uh, you know, to try to treat the, the illnesses, the social and political illnesses as best you can. And if that makes you hated, well, that makes you hated. Um, so that's what political leadership is. Political leadership is not flattering your audience. That is weakness. That is weak political leadership because then you're really just seeking out what, you know, 51% or more of the people want and just saying you agree with that thing. Um, and that's pandering. That's flattery. Um, and in fact, even when you're kind of riding the crest of a wave of popular opinion that's that. Uh, you know, you've got the people backing you, you're not actually strong, Socrates suggests. You are kind of epiphenomenal. You are, you are, you are riding the imagination, the, the wave produced by the imagination of, um, of your followers. And, but really it's them you're beholden to. You're not actually doing the leading. Um, and so one, uh, you know, one upshot for the present is to say that, the idea that the way that we run many, many things today and that the, the way that we think about democratic politics is oftentimes to look at opinion polls that say, well, what are the majority of the people want in any given time? What do they think about a given um, political issue? And then, well, the me in the media, we will see criticisms of political figures for not doing things that are popular. Why aren't people following what the majority want? Why aren't leaders following what the majority want? In Socrates' view, this is not the right question to ask. It's absolutely the wrong question to ask. The, the question to ask is not, what do most people want? It's not that most people are always wrong. They're not. Remember, Socrates is not critical of every aspect of the democracy. and in, in fact, he endorses it. But it means that as a leader, you, you aren't just simply going out in every question and, and just saying, well, what do 51% of the people want? that's what we should do. You actually have to look at things. You actually have to examine reality and then offer your advice. And if your advice is not wanted, then it's not wanted. If that makes you unpopular, it makes you unpopular. Um, so the whole idea of running politics essentially as a polling exercise, just always trying to figure out what's going to give you the most votes, uh, what's the most popular opinion, then you take that side and then you get elected. Um, that's cowardice. That's, and again, this is not a criticism of democracy per se. It's a criticism of a kind of democracy that takes political leadership to be just the same thing as salesmanship, the same thing as pandering or flattery. So democracies depend, Socrates suggests, on the health of a democracy depends on leaders not being panderers, not being flatterers. 
the problem is that the evidence suggests, you know, in ancient Athens, this is what Socrates is criticizing, um, that many of the leaders are in fact just panderers. They, they are only interested in, in salesmanship and, and they're not actually interested, and they're, they're people like Callicles. Um, they're not actually interested in doing what is true or what is best uh, or what is healthiest. All right, next slide. Um, so then we also have um, this final myth about the judgment of souls um, after death by Rhinos and Matt, Radamanthus and uh, Iacus um, as a way of kind of concluding this case for why, you know, individuals shouldn't um, seek wrongdoing in their life, which, of course, Callicles was saying, you know, it's fine to go ahead and, and do wrong because that's that's better than suffering wrong. Socrates says the opposite. Some have thought that Socrates closing with a, a mythic argument about what happens after death is a kind of failure of Socrates' argument. My claim to you is that, in fact, because Plato has shown us that kind of Socrates' argument doesn't succeed in convincing um, people like Callicles, that this mythic ending is not, therefore, a kind of a backdoor way of saying, oh, well, we recognize, I recognize that the argument wasn't that convincing, so now I'm going to give you a myth to kind of just hopefully make you believe if you if you didn't anyway. Um, Plato knows that many people were not convinced by the earlier argument. So it's a way of continuing the argument um, in a different way to supplement what is not necessarily convincing. You, you, you can't you can't lead people to a better life by rhetorical tricks and, and, and tactics. You may be able to silence people, Plato suggests, but you're not going to actually be able to turn people to actually see things the way you want. You actually need, this text suggests, you actually need a myth. You need myths to help people um, think differently about their lives and what is good and and what is right to do with their lives. Um and so this su suggests that myth, sort of in, in, in thinking about kind of political argument today, that it's, it's not just about getting all myths out of political argument, um, but it's about trying to find better myths to counteract the myths we don't like. So, you know, thinking about, um, you know, how to think about Canada as a, as a nation, um, and, and kind of Canada's national story. Well, there, there are all kinds of older myths about um, Canada as, you know, uh, as a kind of kind and righteous nation, um, you know, co contrasted with kind of the Im imperialism and aggressiveness of, of, uh, of our southern neighbor, uh, for one thing. And recent um, criticisms about um, about, uh, you know, a treatment of, of indigenous, uh, peoples, uh, in, you know, Canadian territory have certainly suggested that some of these earlier myths about Canada were, um, were, you know, were not founded on all the facts. Um, the suggestion, I think, from a kind of platonic perspective, the, pl the Plato who's writing this dialogue is that it, it's, it's perfectly fine to criticize, you know, myths, criticize national myths, myths of identity. Um, but what's also important is to provide counter myths, other myths that can supplement so that um, so that people are given a different version of who they are. Maybe they can incorporate if, if you were, you know, so interested in, um, you know, trying to take truth and reconciliation uh, seriously, you would, you would be trying to create different national myths that may include some of the some of the difficulties some of the some of the terrible things um that have been done in the in the canadian past um but you know packaging these kind of thinking about them in such a way that there might still be some aspects of canadian identity to embrace you know even while acknowledging the sins of the past so this is one way that we could think about kind of how to pull you know, Plato's argument, or at least some of the arguments that, that occur in this text um, into the present. Um, so myths, maybe politics. Yes, there are troubling myths. There are problems with some of the, some of our national myths. Um, but Plato suggests, you know, it, it, it may be that what we need is better and different myths to supplement these rather than just thinking that we can do without myths. Because 
without myths at all, we don't necessarily get a better politics because in politics, when we are just interested in debating uh, and refuting others, just by refuting others, you don't actually supply them with a kind of better alternative or a, a kind of rationale that's actually going to motivate them to live a different life. It may be that we need that mythic structure. So with Callicles, um, where Socrates is going to refute him, but can't actually bring him around to his point of view um, just with just through the refutations, you need something else. So it, it shows us that there is there is a complicated relationship between, you know, kind of rational, kind of quote unquote logical argument, debate and deliberation that needs some more of this kind of mythic storytelling or narrative. Um, and that there is an interesting uh, tension, but also complementarity between these two practices rather than just um, some kind of fundamental antagonism that, you know, politics should only be about rational debate and, you know, all myths and narrative need to just be thrown out. Um, Plato at least doesn't seem to think that that's the case. Okay, so I'm going to close the thought uh, for this uh, lecture on Plato there. I will have, I guess, part final part three of this filling in for last week. I will talk about Shunza and then talk a little bit about uh, kind of the semester so far and the four ways uh, of, uh, of doing political theory and how it relates to some of our thinkers. All right, bye for now.